Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Attorney Roy Oppenheim here for our 26th consecutive Zoom at noon. Uh, last week, we talked about the K-shaped recovery and how the economy uh, is basically creating winners and losers. And it's kind of like the best of times and the worst of times all at the same time. This week, we're going to be talking about how interest rates are fueling the single family home boom. As usual, I want to thank my sponsors, Oppenheim Law, our law firm, and Weston Title and Escrow. As many of you know, uh, we've been servicing the community of South Florida and the entire state now for over 30 years. Uh, besides uh, myself, we have my, my partner, Ellen, Ellen Polelski, and we have Jeff Sherman, and my, my partner who's handling uh, the, the, the controls today, and, and Mia Singh, senior associate, and Paula Vergara and, and Wayne Patton. Wayne handles our trust and estates, and Paula handles our intellectual property. And Mia uh, is a commercial litigator who also helps with uh, providing services in, in the area of, of probate. Uh, I also want to introduce our guest, Steve Perigo. And Steve uh, has been uh, in the mortgage business for 30 years. Uh, he's been in the mortgage lending business, specifically he's a senior mortgage consultant and originator, and he specializes in residential financing uh, with clear to uh, close, home, close home, home loans. Uh, prior to the residential mortgage origination uh, business, Steve was involved in underwriting, so he knows a lot about what it takes to get a loan approved. Uh, again, for those of you who are going to be considering to refinance your 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 homes, or you're going to be buying a new home, obviously Weston Title is here to serve you, as well as, of course, the, the law firm, and uh, we hope we'll be able to, to assist you in those areas. So even though last week we talked about a K-shaped uh, recovery, there's also a V-shaped economy that we want to talk about today. And the V-shaped economy is occurring more on the side of, of the upper half of the K for those folks who are doing okay in this, in this environment. And what we're seeing here is uh, the strong housing envir environment uh, that has occurred during the pandemic. If we, if we can take the, the cursor, we can see that, that obviously during the crisis, uh, month after month after March, uh, the number of, of homes that were uh, being purchased uh, in terms of home sale, you know, dropped almost precipitously, you know, by 30%, and then very quickly, came back up. And so we see that with the dark blue with new home sales, which has gone off the top and is, has broken records that we haven't seen in, in years. Existing homes, which is the orange, uh, also uh, is, is doing quite well. And then purchase mortgage applications, which is the gray one, is, is kind of a reflection of both of those. But it doesn't take into account those people who are buying for cash. And that's why that, the, the, the blue is, is so high, is because a lot of new homes are being purchased actually for cash. So we're seeing this crazy V-shape. Uh, here we're seeing an interesting picture that, that Lance Oppenheim, who put this presentation together, decided to, to include. This is someone uh, in front of the Plaza Hotel in New York. I'm not sure exactly what he's doing, uh, but he's doing something, and it, it just reflects the, the, the new world that, that we're in. By the way, uh, some of these charts we get are from the Federal Reserve, and they, uh, they produce great, great work. And this comes from uh, the Federal Reserve in, uh, I think, St. Louis. If we move the, the picture possibly a, a little bit away, we can actually see that uh, this is a four week moving average of initial jobless claims. And we're seeing that those jobless claims are dropping precipitously and uh, still slightly higher than they were at the peak of, of the last crisis. But it, it's coming close to uh, actually we're coming back to 1980, actually, not even to 2000. Uh, so we're we're getting. Uh, close to where, where we were in terms of new claims, but that still doesn't reflect the fact that over 10% of our population is unemployed, and in Florida, it may even be 11%. If we look at personal consumption expenditures, again, if we can move the picture, uh, what we're gonna see is um, that um, our consumption habits are now, after we, we, we get through that little V again, as we can see, back to where we were in 2015. So we're buying and spending where we were about five years ago. And so right now, we, we've lost you know, five years of, of consumption growth, but presumably after the notion of, of there being a vaccine of some kind or therapeutic care really, really kicks into the level that, that the administration suggests, we could see some accelerated consumption based on all the cash that's on the sidelines. And that cash uh, is, is, is in money markets with over $7 trillion, as I mentioned before. And now we're seeing a lot of wealth effect that we really haven't talked much about in terms of people who think that they have no more money than they did before 
because A, they were spending less, and B, because they, their 401ks and their, and their stock portfolios are starting to bulge. And so they're going to want to use some of that money to, to consume in terms of buying new homes, going on vacations, eating out. But all that is not going to happen until such time that, that there's a vaccine and people feel comfortable to, to get out of their home and fly again. Um, pandemic update. What we're seeing in, in, in this picture is that there are parts of the country that at this point are almost unaffected by, by the pandemic and it, it's, it's self-explanatory where those areas are. You have some hot spots, but there are places in the country that it's, it's really life is normal. They're going to restaurants, schools are open. And so it isn't a one size fits all. And the idea that you can you know, open the entire country, close the whole country, it's kind of like real estate. It's location, location, location. And depending on, on your location is gonna determine exactly what's going on. And so we're seeing like in Wyoming or Montana, uh, where many people have decided to move from some of the, the, the eastern and west and the west coast, uh, that things are, are pretty normal there and that, and that restaurants are serving indoors and schools are open. And so uh, it's just an indication of where, where things are going. In terms of Florida, we're seeing, uh, you know, both nationwide in Florida that there are a reduced number of cases, the number of deaths are dropping. And in South Florida, they're, they're in certain parts of South Florida, they're talking about maybe reopening the schools going to phase two where some restaurants would, would be and bars may even be allowed to open and even athletic clubs will be able to, to have more people come in. So this is all very positive. Um, I want to now move to Steve, Steve Perigo, a uh, good friend, someone we've been doing business with for quite some time. And Steve, you there, buddy? I am here. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. And, uh, you know, you, you've been uh, really uh, just so helpful uh, in this whole process to, to us and, and me personally, and I appreciate you, you coming on board today. Thank you so much. My honor for your consideration, sir. Uh, let, let, let's go to this first slide. Millennials help power this, this housing market rebound. So let, let's talk about millennials and, their, and, and what's going on with, with the mortgage market, if, if you would be so kind. Well, as uh, we all know, uh, that there's a lot of uh, multi-generational uh, uh, living going on right now. And the millennials are uh, either living at home and then getting tired of it and finally dipping their toe into that pool. And uh, they're really what's fueling uh, a lot of the home purchases out there. Uh, there's a, a ton of people that are, uh, are making application as you showed in your, your previous slide. Um, it really does show the interest of these folks to go out and, uh, and, and make the time now to buy their house. And so let me ask you, um, where are they getting the down payment from typically? Because that's always, I mean, I remember growing up, you know, and as a young adult, that was always a tough issue for friends of ours and for ourselves is, you know, how do you get that down payment? You know? So down payment obviously comes from uh, a lot of, a number of sources. Uh, as, a, as a mortgage lender, we like to see it in savings. We like uh, to, to see that that person has been able to obtain the savings themselves. However, um, the uh, government and, and FHA and VA lending, uh, even the USDA lending uh, is very favorable uh, with gifts and Fannie and Freddie after the number of years uh, finally kind of got on board with that. So uh, gift funds are, are a big portion now of what people are doing. So you must be seeing a lot of that, I, I would presume. So tell me, tell me about gifts for people who are related and also gifts for people who are unrelated. All right. So really, there are four um, acceptable uh, sources of gift funds. Uh, they are family. Uh, employers or labor unions, um, close friends or fiancés, and then the charitable organizations or uh, governmental organizations that give grants. And so, um, you know, obviously that covers the spectrum. The, the more interesting one is, is family. Uh, they like you to be a blood relative. That's, that's the preferred thing. But what's interesting is you get into close friends and fiancés. The verbiage that's used in the, uh, in the FHA book is clearly defined and documented interest. So you have to be able to show that uh, there is a relationship between that person who's going to be your, your fiance or your close friend uh, and, and, you know, convince or, or sell an underwriter that this isn't, uh, you know, just a person that uh, is, is a random in your life. That's so, so showing uh, your engagement ring on Facebook would count as, 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 as you, evidence. You know what? I, I've actually seen people uh, show uh, uh, announcements for marriage. Uh, I've seen pictures of engagement rings, um, it, it contracts for venues to get married in the future, uh, those types of, uh, of documents. So it has to be well-documented. 
So, so here we have a picture, Steve, of uh, literally people lining up either to make offers or, or to actually go through a showing. There, there are places all over the country right now where when a house gets lifted, listed within an hour, you could have five or six offers, and sometimes they're over, overpriced, I, I mean, o over the asking price. And so a lot of that must have to do with low interest rates. Let, let's talk about that. Yeah, the interest rates are absolutely fueling this thing. Um, you know, obviously, interest rate is is dependent upon a person's qualifications. It's dependent uh, upon the amount of money for down payment that they're uh, exercising. And obviously, credit score is, is the largest impactor of uh, people's interest rates. And, and, and interest rates right now are at, at absolute historical lows, are they not? Would you they, say? They, they are absolutely at historical lows. Um, I've seen uh, on, on my money sheets uh, as low as 1.99, two and a quarter. It's available and it's out there if you want to pay for it. Right. Steve, we, we already have some questions. And by the way, uh, for those of you who are uninitiated, this is supposed to be interactive. I mean, Steve and I are interacting, but the whole idea is for you all, if you have questions to participate or comment or you disagree with something that we're saying, chime in, make a comment, and we'll be glad to address it. We already have uh, three or four questions. Let me ask the first one. Are there new mortgage requirements such as required higher credit scores or higher down payments? Yes, and we can thank COVID-19 for that. Um, when the COVID struck back in March, uh, across the board, everybody tightened up the guidelines for lending, especially uh, in that FHA or that government arena. Uh, we saw the minimum credit scores uh, go uh, that lenders want to accept. And I stress that that's a lender thing. It's not the FHA, but a lender thing. And they raised those uh, three and a half percent down, uh, down payment rate uh, credit scores from 580 up to, in many cases, 660. And some companies even went higher than that. And, and it, also the jumbo market seemed to seize up initially during COVID. What, 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 what was going on there? In your opinion? Yeah, it absolutely did. Again, because so many people, th this thing just has, has affected so many people, uh, self-employed people. There are special now underwriting guidelines and additional documentation that uh, all uh, lending institutions and Fannie and Freddie instituted, uh, you know, to make sure that a person is a still working or B, even if they've kept their job, that their hours weren't impacted or the flow of their business uh, was not impacted. Uh, someone wants to know how long you think the uh, refinance boom will last. And, and so what they're asking you is how long will the Federal Reserve really keep down interest rates, I guess, is really the, the correlative to that question. Well, the, the speculation is in what they've told us, and, that, and I, I, I say told us because that could change tomorrow if the economic factors change. Uh, the plan is really to keep rates in the same uh, range where they're at now all the way through next year. Now, well, certainly the through the election. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely <laughs> through the election. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, like I say, right now, they're, they're kind of saying all the way through at least next year, uh, they're going to keep that, that bank uh, lending rate down, which should correspond to these rate of interests uh, for, for the period of time. Now, that could absolutely be affected by different economic factors. And if we start seeing inflation, uh, they're talking about that perhaps, uh, as a matter of fact, in the last Fed statement, uh, they said that they were uh, open to it running a little hot at times. And if that happens, that could change the whole game. So, so that, that could be a precursor to what, we, what I was alluding to earlier, that if and when, and I'm going to say when, but it really is if, when there is a, a vaccine and it becomes publicly accepted as opposed to, oh, we have a vaccine like the Russians have a vaccine, okay? But I mean, when there's a vaccine that we all find comfortable to take, things are going to just go crazy because there's this pent up demand and, and, and the expectation is, and we, and we did a Zoom on this, that there, this could be another roaring 20s, that there just could be a, a just enormous amount of cash and, and that would, you know, increase velocity and by at the end of the day would increase inflation, which means at that point, the Fed would have to increase interest rates slightly probably. A absolutely. And we're seeing that already in little bits and pieces of things with all of the Fed stimulus money. Uh, that's hit the marketplace. Uh, we have, uh, I don't know if you heard the report that came out the other day with uh, uh, new builds are, are just going through the ceiling right now, but you're seeing that lumber prices are 111% higher this year than they were last year. So this is just an example of some of the uh, inflation that they could see, and those are the things that they're watching for, and when that begins to happen across the board, and, and within your and within your industry, there's almost a form of inflation. You artificially increase prices to reduce the volume. You're like like throttling back 
the velocity and volume of, of applications because you just can't handle it. Let, let's talk about that because people have no clue about that. Yeah. So, yeah, we are absolutely right now going through a capacity uh, challenge in, in the industry. So when this thing started and interest rates really kind of rock bottomed for the first time, even before COVID, that happened back in January and February was the first little blip of it. And uh, they say that there are about, um, that's a number, five to seven million people uh, who can benefit from a refinance based on where interest rates are now. Well, when that number hit the three and 2% range, uh, the, the market went crazy with refinances and they were up like 600% at the beginning of the year. So, so obviously there's only, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I, I, and I'll say, I don't want to be shameless here, but, but you know, what we're suggesting for those who are listening, my friends and family, if you have an interest rate that's somewhere north of, what do you think? Three and a half, four percent, right? Uh, yeah, absolutely north of four percent. Absolutely north of four percent. And and I'm telling you what, we're seeing people refinancing who have uh, rates currently uh, in the three and a quarter and three and a half percent range. Now, uh, the strategy there, obviously, for them, they're not going to save a, 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 as much money. But what they're doing is reducing terms. And a lot of them are going to 25 and 20 and 15 year mortgages and then taking advantage of the, the time savings. Right. And, and also, if you're planning on staying in your home for at least a year or a year and a half, you'll break even. I mean, that's usually the break even point. Is and, and, well, it, it, again, it depends on the amount of your closing costs, the amount of your balance and how much you spend on those closing costs. Uh, next question, is it easier or harder for self-employed people to get a loan because of COVID? It is harder, no question about it. There are, like I say, uh, the uh, lending uh, institutions have all instituted what are called overlays, and those are special things that uh, they need to be more comfortable to, again, assure them that a self-employed person hasn't been affected uh, by the pandemic. Uh, this is a technical question, but I'm going to ask it. Are asset-based or stated income loans uh, out the window or products like that still exist? If so, what are the parameters? Uh, they absolutely still exist, believe it or not. And again, when COVID hit, that all dried up for about 90 days. Uh, now we're beginning to see some of that asset-based and that uh, non-qualified uh, mortgage or non so are, are those mortgage. what we call liar loans and what got us in trouble last time? You know what, they're not, and I'll tell you the reason why. So what they're, they've done is they've kind of gone around the block and, and you know, uh, you have to be able to prove that you can make a payment. And so um, even the non-QM stuff, they've gone into things like using bank statements, uh, 24 months worth of bank statements, 12 months worth of bank statements, six months. I saw uh, one of my investors this week released a two-month bank statement program. Now, you're not just given two months and they're going to say that, oh, that's exactly what you make. No, you're going to have to get a P&L statement from your uh, accountant to show what you did last year and, and where your money is, but it's a whole lot less than or a whole lot better than those that don't show the money on their taxes. So there are probably some retirees who are, who are on, the, uh, on, on the Zoom today. And I guess the question, how do retired people get mortgage loans, whether they're reverse mortgages or regular mortgages? when they may have retirement assets, but their income is, is not that great. So how does, how does that work? Because it's very interesting. So, so the asset-based stuff, they, they've let, lessened or laxened a little bit of those uh, uh, guidelines now. And what they're doing in a lot of cases, they take the total amount of assets that someone has and they divide it by 36 months. And then they can actually use that money because that's what they're drawing off of for their mortgage qualification. That's what they use for their qualifying income. Uh, someone said, where, where do we see rates in the next three months or next year? Have the VOE requirements changed because of COVID? Uh, yes. Tell people, yes. Means, tell people what VOE is. First. All right. So VOE is verification of employment. And during the COVID crisis, uh, they were verifying employment all the way up until after your loan closed to make sure that you didn't close on Friday and resign on your job on Monday. So uh, verification of employment, uh, the standard guideline was you did a verbal verification before closing. It could be any time 10 days before. Well, when COVID hit, they changed that guideline and they brought it all the way up to we need to see the last pay stub you had before closing and we're verifying your employment on the date that you fund. So everything was, was very labor intensive and, and tied the system up. And again, you talk about the capacity issues that are going on and just the sheer number of loans uh, that are out there, that really has, uh, has, has worked uh, against the timing of, of how long it takes to close to. 
There's a question here about banks versus mortgage brokers. Tell us, tell us what the difference is in terms of the rates and the process, because there's, right. you know, some people just only borrow from a bank when it comes to a mortgage. But in fact, the mortgage brokerage community probably controls what percent of, the, of all mortgages? Probably a very well, high it, it's, it's actually growing. Uh, back at the peak, and that happened before the last crash, uh, independent mortgage brokers uh, were at about 65 to 70 percent of the originations. Now, after the crash, that, that fell fell drastically actually. And now I think uh, the numbers last I heard, they're about 25 to 30% of, of the market. But you know, it's real simple. If you go to your bank, uh, they have one set of guidelines or one set of programs and they're a bank. So their box is gonna be a lot smaller than an independent, uh, you know, non uh, FDIC insured uh, bank. So now you have mortgage bankers that are out there who have the ability to buy and sell loans, deliver both to Fannie and Freddie and to different uh, 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 correspondents. And that opens that box and makes it a little bit bigger. Um, and so uh, they, it also expands the qualifying guidelines. So when you're doing business with uh, a, a banker or a mortgage broker, there's more opportunity because they have more sources. It's not just one set of guy. Most banks or a lot of banks do portfolio, right? Some of them do, some of them do, but a majority, and yeah, you, the, the portfolio banks, you know, they can make their own rules, which right. is real nice. And you referenced uh, stated loans uh, earlier. I've got a handful of portfolio loans that, you know, if you're putting 25 or 30% down and you've got a 740 credit score, um, they don't make you give your tax returns, your, your uh, anything. It, it basically, they, they, you don't even have to state. They, they'll do it based on your credit and the down payment that you're doing. Steve, if someone wants to ask you a specific question, are you concerned that the big, the big housing demand will lead to a housing bust when things steady itself out? Ask that again. I'm sorry. Are you concerned that, that the housing demand that, that, that we're seeing right now will lead to a bust, housing bust, when things steady themselves out? I don't believe so. And, and it's certainly not here in South Florida. You know, you hit the nail on the head earlier when you said location, location, location. You know, obviously there are going to be some areas uh, in the country where things level off quicker than others. And it's where do you want to be, right? Out there in Montana, they're not certainly not going to see the, the demand that we have here in Florida or, in, you know, a lot of the coastal areas where the demands are a lot higher. Um, you know, I see this thing uh, being a, a, a case of supply and demand that until there's more people who want to list and, uh, it, and even in, of the inventory based on the number of people who want to buy, uh, you know, the, the mortgage paper is what killed it last time because of all the hybrid loans and, and the stated products. And uh, we have the strongest mortgage guidelines and paper that we've written in the, in the lifetime of history uh, behind us now. So. Steve, it's a I may pretty have, good foundation. I'm sorry. I, I may have shared this slide with you, but it shows how boomers now, as we talked about earlier, are, are the biggest folks who are applying for loans compared yep. to the millennials, Generation Z, Generation X. It's, it's really fascinating. And that in, in around 2017, it looks like that's, that's when there was a convergence between Gen X, I guess, and, and the boomers. Yeah, the uh, the baby boomers, not the boomers, and the and and, and the millennials. Excuse me. I, I right, right, and, and so you know, again, you had that phenomenal uh, or phenomenon of in the baby boomers cases, a lot of them went to buy bigger homes because of things that were going on in their lives, and they had multi generational uh, type of situations going on, and so they needed more room. And with COVID, certainly it brought out people who were living in the city who wanted to get away and have more space and more room. And that's just really, really fueled the demand. You know, I, thought, it, it, I think it starts fascinating as we're seeing uh, what's going on demographically uh, in, the, uh, in the community. Of course, the silent generation, I mean, they're, they're getting older, so that they're, they're kind of a non-issue. But uh, it is fascinating how the boomers are, I mean, I keep saying the boomers, the millennials are starting to drive the real estate market and the mortgage market more than any other demographic. So that's, that's fascinating. But Steve, we, you and I were talking about either last night or yesterday sometime. Uh, about how people who have mortgages, if they just would pay their mortgage every two weeks or twice a month, how they could shorten the length of. of yeah, it, uh, oh, it's yeah. it's a, a, a little trick that's in the industry that, uh, you know, is getting a little bit more well known now as people begin to talk a little bit about it. But, uh, you know, mortgage loans are all simple interest loans. And so the, the more often that you reduce that balance, the less interest you're being charged because it's always based on the outstanding balance. Right? You, could pay, you could pay it every Friday. You could pay a quarter of your mortgage payment. 
Absolutely, you sure right. can. And if you did that, you would knock off years, right? Years. Uh, yeah, the approximate is uh, about seven years on a 30-year mortgage if you just paid it weekly or paid it even biweekly. Right, unbelievable. So that, that's kind of a neat thing. And, and that doesn't mean you're actually shelling out more money. It just means you're shelling it out faster and right. just turning that interest clock. You're not turning it off, but you're slowing that interest clock dramatically. Yeah, your effective rate of interest is much lower because you're paying it so much quicker and it's uh, not charging as, as, as much interest. Very, very interesting. Uh, any other questions we have here? Oh, what is the acceptable credit score to qualify for a mortgage? I mean, I guess that, that that's so open-ended, but I'll let you play with that. All right, well, thank you. And credit scores is really what it's all about. And that really is going to determine your mortgage rate as well. And so... Uh, right now, the conventional uh, credit score bottom line, bottom end is 620, and that is for a, a standard conventional loan. Uh, those with loan amounts up to 510,400. Uh, now, when you get into FHA, they've dropped that now, and it goes down to 580. But what you have <clears throat> with those uh, interest rates, I'm sorry, with those credit scores, is you have what are called loan level price adjustments. So the cost of that rate is more, uh, the lower your credit score is. Interesting. I, I want to also ask you uh, what your thoughts were about the banking community or lending community's uh, thoughts on lending on a condo versus a, a single family home right now. And if there's like an extra interest rate that's, uh, that's being kind of plugged in because the, the condo market hasn't responded as well as, as the residential uh, family home market. Well, Roy, Florida is very special in that regard. We have our own set of rules when it comes to condos. It's different than anywhere in the country. Uh, unfortunately, because of the number of condos that we have and how they're managed, 90% of the condominiums, 90 to 95% of them don't qualify for what's called a full review, which is what Fannie and Freddie, uh, the, the secondary market, uh, requires in order to buy a home with less than 25% down on these condominiums. And so um, by virtue of that, people have to come in and put larger down payments on these condos in order to fit into the association guideline. Uh, the association, uh, you know, let's say there are rules and guidelines having to do with what passes that full review. And a limited review is with 25% down and it skips a bunch of the questions uh, that, that you have to, and, and association uh, guidelines that you have to have in order to buy with less down. And, and, and that's just for Florida or South Florida, or you think that's like a- No, nope, that is the whole state of Florida, and it's different than the rest of the country. So limited review in Florida is 25% down. The rest of the country, it's only 10% down. So we are special here, and wow. we have our own, own, own set of rules. Uh, is there any other questions? Let me see. You think, uh, let me see. Uh, because of the refi boom, lenders are swamped with business. Should realtors go 45 days on an offer? You know what? It, it, it's the more time you give somebody it is typically the better, but I'm not going to tell you that I don't have investors. And again, it all builds into price. Now, if you need something done quickly, I've got a lender I can close you with in two weeks. Now it's going to cost you a little bit more in either discount points or interest rates because the guy who's giving that kind of service is not going to be the best price guy on the street. So can you get a deal done? Absolutely. My purchase monies right now are closing between 25 and 35 days. Now, I've got a handful of investors, even people who want really, really attractive interest rates on a purchase that always takes priority over the refinances. And uh, the mar mortgage market knows that they have to take care of those transactions in a timely fashion so they make sure it happens. Steve, we are, as usual, out of time and I can keep going with you and people could keep asking us questions probably for another half hour. But I want to you know, thank Steve, Steve Perigo of Clear to Close Home Loans. Uh, Steve, this was great. I want to thank you. Uh, for those who've been with us now for 26 weeks, I want to thank you all for joining us. As you know, uh, our law firm is here to assist you. A lot of the stuff we're doing right now is COVID related. Sometimes we have situations where people can't close on a home. Uh, they could be the buyer. They could be the seller. Sometimes the realtor's involved. So we're dealing with all those situations. We're dealing with tons of commercial leases right now, representing both landlords as well as tenants, trying to work things out. Uh, we have a lot of folks whose businesses have been shut down for such a long period of time that the likelihood of their recovery is not very high. And they have to consider, you know, chapter five, uh, subchapter five in a, in a 
chapter 11 bankruptcy. So we're assisting people in that area. I mean, there's just a host of issues that, that we're dealing with. But for those of you who uh, you know, are able to, refinancing is a great time. Finding a home right now is a great time. Selling a home, even, even a better time. And Weston Title, our sister company, can more than assist you with that. And of course, Steve can more than assist you on the, on the brokerage side. So once again, I want to thank everyone at Oppenheim Law and at Weston Title for joining us today at Zoom at noon. And we look forward to seeing you next week for Zoom at noon, number 27. Have a great week, Steve. Thank you so very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Pleasure. Thank you.